Good morning, guys. Thank you for coming and fulfilling SoccerX commitment to being on time. We start exactly at 11.25. And without further ado, I'd like to pass the floor to Sinto, who's got a presentation that begins presenting yourself. So yeah. welcome. No, 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 I, I don't have the slide. I, no, I, I, so please no. do. No, no, present. No, no, your show. From Johan Cruyff Institute. Yeah. Welcome here. Thank so you very much. You have the floor. Yeah. Yeah, it's yours. yeah, so I'm not sure. I don't have my my slide my presentation, but my, Tell us who you are. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm Sinto Ashram. It's it's not an easy last name, I know. It's from Syria. Uh, I'm now the consulting director of Johan Correo Institute, and I used to to work in FC Barcelona as as the head of uh, partnership activation. So so a lot of experiences. And I'm, well, first of all, thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here and, 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 and to represent Johan Cruyff Institute in, in the US, uh, a new market and a big market for us as well. I, I have five, six, or seven slides, so it's not, I, I'm gonna try to, to go as fast as possible. Um, and I want to start with two recent infographics. The first one, it's uh, the t-shirt, the, the jersey sells in the, in the US. And, and this is really interesting. It's, it's from last week, from soccer.com. And, and why, why I'm, I'm using this? Because uh, I want to, to show that America is already a really interesting market. Not only for football clubs, as you, as you can see here, and, and and there is a big dispersion of, of football clubs. This is the, the jersey sales in the US state by state and of all European football clubs, okay? And you can see the number of football clubs that are the most solar in, in every single state. And this is interesting because not only for football clubs that they, they can engage with, with all supporters and with all fans in the American and around the world, but also for sponsors you know because uh, if you are a sponsor of FC Barcelona and you know that they are they have a, a great power for in, in the US you can connect also with these with these uh, funds okay and the second one and it's probably the the summer revolution you know, the same uh, for of Cristiano Ronaldo for Juventus is interesting because it, it's the same no? uh, nowadays um, the all social media networks and, and Facebook, Instagram, and, and everything are, are one of the key assets for all the sponsorships. And, and here you can see uh, some interesting data, okay? Uh, you see Juventus followers, Real Madrid followers, and Cristiano Ronaldo followers. And as you can see, Real Madrid and Cristiano Ronaldo followers are more or less the same. It's not fully the same, but more or less and Juventus are far away from that data, okay? What's, what happened when, in, in my point of view, this is a brilliant commercial strategy because when Juventus sign Cristiano Ronaldo, they automatically get millions and millions of followers. And this is really interesting for all sponsors because they automatically want to engage to these million followers. Um, yeah. And going more in detail, I use this example from that when, when I was working in FC Barcelona. For me, Rakuten, it's, the, it's probably the best example of how a sport a sponsorship is the best communication platform, you know? And why why I saying that? Because Rakuten used the jersey of FC Barcelona as the best communication platform without ads, without extra publicity. It's the best possible publicity campaign, okay? I have this video regarding the power of emotions. Let me, I'm, I'm not sure it works. Ney, la penjara Neymar, aparecer sin Robert. Oh, 
Why, why sponsors? Why, why brands? Why, what makes it special? Probably the power of emotion. It's two minutes like that. Okay? But these emotions are the most powerful, and it's it's something that we cannot pay with money. Okay, and why? This is probably the best, the most emotional moment that I I ever lived in my in my life in and mostly when I was the head of financial activation in FC Barcelona. I see thousands and thousand people hugging, uh, crying, uh, jumping, and we 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 registered a, a real earthquake in in Camp Nou that day. So it, it was incredible. And, but the most important thing is that the, the next day, every single FC Barcelona sponsors, including Gatorade, want to, to link their brand with this emotion, okay? But you need to be careful as well, because there are a good emotions and bad moments, and you need to, to be aware of that, okay? As a third idea, and very, very fast, I want to, to introduce the, the idea of technology, okay? And, and here, okay? And here you can, you can see the virtual LED, and this is really a great tool for regional sponsorships. Because nowadays, you can use the LED in different, uh, as a segmentation tool in different countries, and you can have in the same category different brands for every single country, okay? And, and this is really, really interesting. And at the same time, this opens um, great opportunities, not only for different sponsors, but also for the same brand that have at sub brands in, in, in each country. Okay, you can use the Asian feed, the Middle East, for region or country by country. And last but not least, I'm, I was on the activation side, and I need to, to explain that. For me, the, one of the most important things is the activation plans. Okay? You can use all the sponsorship as a communication platform, but if you don't have a really detailed activation plan, mm, does not make sense. Okay, so thank you. Well, please round of applause. <laughs> we thank you, and now you have five minutes, David. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, so, as an introduction, um, my name is David. I'm vice president of sports at Mailman Group, and today I'm going to talk predominantly on the development of the sports industry specific to sponsorship in China. I've spent the last eight years growing Mailman's sports business, uh, starting with really the launch of what was the very first football club to launch a social profile in China back in 2011, which was Liverpool Football Club, working with other clubs, working with brands involved in sports, working with the leagues and federations in their market entry strategy, uh, and ultimately trying to fulfill what is everyone's goal in here is how do you develop revenue channels out of the biggest sports market in the world. So this is a fairly established room with a lot of established commercial deals, but China has really only existed as, as a professional sports industry since 2008 Olympics. So we're way behind the rest of the world. There's a, a general concept that it's full of businessmen would walk around with bags of money wanting to sponsor anyone and everyone who has a sports IP. Uh, it's really not the case. Um, it is growing very, very fast, but it's so far behind the rest of the world in that respect. Uh, to give you a, an idea, this was, that first one was a picture of Shanghai on the Bund 25 years ago, and this is what it looks like today. It's, wow. it's wildly different. Uh, that's a small snapshot of how fast the industry changes, and of course, sports is no different. 1.4 billion population does not mean 1.4 billion football fans or sports fans, as many companies will try and tell you. Uh, realistically, there's about a 100 million strong potential football audience in China. If 
you look at Nielsen data, if you look at people interested in sports, and if you look at concrete followers of uh, sports teams on Weibo, which is the number one uh, social platform. Uh, in the same vein, most investors, most tech companies, most brands are looking to spend their China marketing budgets on China IP, on China sports teams. So as an international sports property, your job of getting and gaining sponsorship in China is now doubly diff difficult because you have such tough uh, domestic competition. Most brands look at China regional deals only. Uh, a very limited number of Chinese companies are looking overseas as they have such a huge market in their domestic uh, industry. So unless you are Gatorade and you have a global footprint and you have uh, commercial deals which cover every single territory, uh, if you're really looking to a Chinese brand, you have to look at just the domestic market, which changes the price and very much changes the focus of what rights they are, they are after. Guanxi essentially means relationship building in, in China. It's by far the most important uh, reason why people are investing into building teams and offices. As a foreigner sitting outside of the market, you have almost non-existent chance of doing a deal with a local company. Those relationships are built over time. It's not a case of sitting down at a conference, meeting them for five minutes, and then coming to a deal. It's multiple dinners, uh, multiple shots of baijiu, for any of you who have spent time in China. Um, and to be honest, that's not something that can be done unless you have a local team. Uh, I, I am not the front face of our commercial team. We have local guys in Beijing and Shanghai and down in Shenzhen who do the bulk of that work. We simply come in to take the glory in most cases. Um, so that getting to that decision maker is very, very important. And in the majority of cases, that is not the sponsorship manager. It's not the marketing director. It's the CEO or the CFO. It's the guys that are deciding to spend the money. It's very much a top-down structure when it comes to decision making. And as Mr. Beckham here shows us, success is essentially everything. When you're a fan, if you're a Chinese business, you're only really talking about the top 1%. So from a sponsorship perspective, unless you're Manchester United, Cristiano Ronaldo, or FIFA, you've got a lot of work to do. It's a tough market to, to go into. Most of those organizations have inbound leads coming to them left, right, and center because every single person or brand wants Kobe Bryant. They don't even want Damian Lillard. They want number one, whether he's current or whether he's a legacy player. So we're talking star athletes, winning teams, and global events. Association with, a, with an event either coming to China or which has global prestige. This is your competition. You're not necessarily, uh, if you're United, you're not up against Bayern and PSG. You're up against SIPG and Guangzhou Evergrande. If you're an athlete, you're up against the Jackie Chans. You're up against Yao Ming. And in this day and age, you're up against guys that probably most of the people in this room have never even heard of, but have 50 to 100 million followers and are making obscene amounts of money through their social programs just in China and have very little audience overseas. Luhan being a great example of that, uh, happens to be a Manchester United fan, which is great for the club. Um, so why, why are sponsorship decisions made by a brand? Well, normally it's honestly a CEO decision. It is not something that is researched by the brand teams. It does not necessarily fit in with a marketing campaign that's being run. It's a CEO decision and for whatever reason, whether he's raising, raising money for a, for a uh, new investment, whether he's about to go public or whether he wants global awareness, he simply makes a call and says, I believe I'm a fan of AC Milan. I think we should do a deal with AC Milan. That is then passed down the chain to a marketing team who are relatively unprepared for this. Uh, they are told, we've just signed Kobe Bryant. Um, off you go. They don't have a long-term plan. They've not been prepping for it, especially when it comes to an event. You have a very, very short lead-up time to activate. For the World Cup this year, I think FIFA did four of their six or seven Chinese sponsors in about four months before the event started. Now, to a, to a Gatorade, that's just unheard of to launch a major sponsorship with only four months of preparation. You should be looking at that deal a year, two years in advance. It should be tied in with a clear company structure, a direction, uh, in, in many cases a campaign, a hashtag, and then you go to market and you look for the talent. It's totally in reverse in, in China. You, you're starting with the talent, the CEO makes the deal, then the deal comes, then the idea has to come, and the rights holder 
is forced to actually spend a hell of a lot of their time and money supporting with the activation. Whereas the traditional model is, here you go, thank you for paying us, here's the rights, off you go. In China, it doesn't work like that. The deal will fail unless it's much more of a collaborative partnership, often requiring actual marketing investment from the, the IP themselves. And then when it comes to ROI, how are these deals measured? In many deals I know, they spend multi-million dollars really just to get a photo. The CEO just wants a photo with the athlete. The rest of it just doesn't matter. Whether it's a press event, you'll see and hear about strategic partnerships in China every other week. Now what that means is two brands have come together, done a press event, and then nothing happens again after that. It's all about that moment, it's about the announcement, everybody gets excited, they talk about it, and then that's the end of that. No money changes hands in many cases, so it's purely a, a media awareness tool. Um, and then items like signed shirts, which is so commonplace if you work in, in sports, are like gold dust to these guys. They'll, they'll start negotiating once the deal's done, you've got a piece of paper with the contract on it, it doesn't mean a whole lot, to be honest. Uh, they read it, they sign it, and then they move on. And you will have to come back to that and renegotiate halfway through the deal. So before we move on, I think just a couple of points would be when structuring a deal, ensure that as much as possible is paid up front. And that may sound obvious, but you really want to hold back your number one assets, which may not be what you think they are. They may be the, the meeting, they may be the signed photo. Hold that back until you've got the majority of the payments. Because in many cases, these deals do not make the second year. They don't make the third year, uh, let alone the second or the third payments. They put the down payment, they get what they need, and then they look at it like a business decision and they say, well, why would we make the second or third payment? We've already got what we wanted. They don't, it's not necessarily they feel they're breaking contracts, just feel they're making a smart business move, which in fact it is. They're not gonna be tied into a four-year deal with eight payments over four years if they've got what they wanted in the first six months. So you have to be very smart about the way you structure those uh, deals. And secondly, be very flexible. <coughs> Invest in a strong partnerships team because the management of that deal will be much more important than the team that closed the deal in the first place. If you want any chance of long-term success, it'll need to be done in the regular communication, team on the ground, supporting their marketing team and actually trying to make the deal work rather than just taking a bucket load of cash and moving on. Um, I think those are probably, probably the two m main points. Um, so I think my time's up. Happy yes, to, uh, happy your to pass time on. is up. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. Thiago, now the sponsor who pays everybody, please <laughs> indulge us. Well, thank you, my, my name is Thiago Pinto. I'm a Brazilian by origin. I uh, lead uh, the global marketing efforts for Gatorade, uh, uh, based here in the US, but working every country outside of the US uh, uh, for, uh, for PepsiCo. Uh, so my, my point of view, I, I kind of developed a few slides. Well, I'm gonna go uh, very quick, uh, quick through the, this different point of view, which is from the sponsor. What are we looking at when uh, we are discussing a global sponsorship opportunity? First of all, you know, the discussions, every major corporation that uh, uh, works in a uh, complex environment between uh, headquarters somewhere like the US and discussing with the local subsidiaries, partners, uh, uh, associates, or whatever decision, there's always that tension between should we look at scale uh, or global or should we look uh, at glo uh, a, glo a local deal and get a more uh, authentic connection? Are we looking for visibility and that, uh, you know, a, a sponsorship like we have with uh, uh, Football Club Barcelona is unbeatable, right? Or we're looking at activation being more uh, high touch like the case of a club that we sponsor, uh, Club uh, Boca Juniors, which is in the final of uh, Libertadores Cup. And that uh, strong connection with the community in Buenos Aires, we will not replicate to Barcelona as we were replicating these uh, past few weeks uh, in, uh, with uh, the final against River Plate, right? So also uh, around, uh, are we following a trend? Uh, and we, we, are, we are monitoring this very closely uh, you, you, uh, you, you were mentioning the, 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 the shirts sold in, in the U.S. We monitor very closely what's the first allegiance. And it's in, uh, we are very impressed with several countries that the first allegiance is moving so quickly between a local team to a global team. So it used to be in our native Brazil. I'm an international fan. And I could potentially uh, have a second team would be connected to some European team where maybe a player from my team would have gone. And, you know, a, a very loose affiliation. And we're seeing more and more uh, countries that first affiliation being the global team. 
and then the local team. So this trend where we're going or holding on to traditional values and you know, is this something that our brand has been connected forever? Is this something that the consumer expects us to be connected forever? So these are the decisions that you have to take into consideration. Other, other discussion, growth versus dominance, right? Do we want to keep what we have? We're just discussing around Ecuador, uh, where we are, we've been dominant forever in, in the market, or looking to expand into new markets like China, right? These are the decisions that you're going to uh, start weighing in uh, where you want. What, what I like to say is there's no right or wrong decision is depending, depending on what's the moment of the brand and what's the internal discussion within the company, right? I think these, uh, uh, these things can rapidly change and uh, 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 the current market is, is, is um, going through a lot of transformation where we're here uh, debating in, uh, in Miami about that and I'm really glad to participate in a few of these sessions. But uh, the main discussions uh, here, right, as, as we speak, maybe in some room around the stadium, is the La Liga finally going to play the first uh, 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 game abroad? It was an idea that came very recently. It could be a transformational idea, not only for the um, for the U.S. but other major countries that have the economical power. I can imagine China, right? We've seen super clubs of uh, European leagues going elsewhere: China, Morocco. But will their uh, regular league game be played uh, in the U.S.? I, I don't think anyone here believes the discussion. It's about Barcelona and Girona playing in Miami in, in January. It is a, a, a transformation idea around league games being played elsewhere. Is there a place for a Super League? Is there a place for a Global League? So as a sponsor, you're kind of monitoring that because you want to be there at the right moment uh, and, and be agent of change and not having to go on the back end and then paying the, the price for being too late in the decision. A second big uh, decision that we're monitoring very closely, streaming against broadcast, how we're going to relate and give visibility to our brands where should we invest, and who's going to own that content? Is our conversations going to be with, uh, keep being with the major networks? Just met uh, our, our great partners from ESPN. Uh, are we going to still talk to them to get uh, a visibility on, on the, during the games or, or during the, uh, the, the overall broadcast halftime? Or are we going to talk straight to the club? Who's going to manage that, right? Are, are clubs interested in managing that the experience? The, the previous panel talked about fan experience. And the, the, the fan experience of where, where we're going, who, who, who we're going to be talking to, right? Should we start building these relationships with the leagues? Is it with the clubs? Who are we going to be talking to about getting visibility for our brands? Uh, the, the third one that we've been monitoring uh, uh, very closely, we are very strong in the Americas. Some of you that come from Europe might not be that uh, familiar with uh, the strength of our brand in your market. But in the Americas, we're, we're by far the dominant uh, sports rink. And uh, we, we've seen this trend of Latin American clubs, we don't have to get into the details of it, but why is our football weakening and why our players are playing in, uh, in Europe and North America, the growth, but still, right, uh, uh, it, it, the MLS is still not uh, 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 the same level as the European club. Will it ever be? Will it intend to be? Is this uh, the example of Copa America Centenario in 2016 when 16 uh, national teams got together and played in the U.S.? A very different scale from a regular Copa America, right? Is, th is this the trend? Is there, is there where we're going? Are the Americas going to be a rival to Europe in terms of, of scale that a brand can get by investing in the sports, right? So this is, a, this is another one. We could go on and on. 2026, what's the effect in the, in the U.S. market? Uh, if 94 was transformation with the MLS, with the World Cup, the U.S. World Cup, now with Canada and Mexico coming on board, what, with a stronger base in the U.S., what can happen to the game? here in the business for brands like ours. Is this the time to go in? Is, this not, is it going to be too expensive? And then you start comparing what happened in the NBA and NFL in the last 20, 20, 25 years in terms of rights. Have they gone off their, their tipping point? Is, the, uh, is soccer the next thing, right? So I, I think to, to, to make a decision as a brand, first you, you, you got to know your business. This, this is pretty basic. But maybe in China it's not, right? It's about the, the CEO, <laughs> what, what player they are fans. In our case, we're a public trade company. There's, no, there's not a lot of space for, for personal tastes, right? It's about what's important for the business. And most importantly, what's important for our consumer, right? Uh, and I, I, I was just mentioning the bigger trends happening. How, what's going to be our consumer reaction to it? And how are we going to be able to have that conversation, right? Right now, if we, if, we don't, if we don't talk through a mobile phone, we're not talking to our consumer, right? We, 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 we deal with teenagers around the world that are out there playing, uh, playing football and other sports. And, uh, and, and that's the way to do it. And uh, I think the final two recommendations I, I would say as, uh, uh, as a sponsor, first, anticipate your moves. The, 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 the slow one 
the, the one that uh, try to uh, avoid risks, you end up paying a very steep price. I'm just mentioning all these trends, what we're looking at, right? and just uh, giving up a little of our secrets. Because we know if we come at the right time, we pay the right price, we're part of the transformation, we've seen as an authentic mover within the, uh, for our consumers. If we're late, we're just coming up for the, for the photo. But most importantly, you've got to innovate. Because do what's there, and this is the conversation we have a lot of uh, rights holders. Oh yeah, you got to do this, this, and this, and that. No, no, no. That, that's done before our consumer expects that, and that we just, uh, you know, we just disappear in their eyes. Our, our consumer is bombarded by messages and uh, impulses to get to that emotion that you're referring to, but that we, there are great brands doing great work, like Rakuten and other examples that you did. Unless you innovate and have an uh, innovative conversation between rights holder and rights acquire, let's say, you know, the, the deal is not going to be done. You know, to buy 30 second ads, uh, I think we all know that that's, uh, that's uh, the past. And if you don't do that, sure, uh, certainly your competitors uh, will. We, uh, uh, PepsiCo is a company that is used to kind of a strong competition, right? You guys all know who I'm talking about. So we, you know, we're either smart or we're out, even in, at the company. That's how we're evaluated. So I think this is, uh, try to go quickly, wow. what uh, the, the sponsor perspective is in the, in the debate. Thank you. Just some, some remarks. The only reason why we can talk about globalization of sponsorship is because TV at first and internet right now really turned the world into a global village and we can talk to everybody right now in a, two ways because they talk to us as well. Last year was the first year when the investment in advertisement on the internet was higher than the investment on advertisement, on TV. So $205 billion were invested on internet against $190 billion invested on TV. Google alone holds one fourth of the global advertisement industry nowadays. And why? Because when you see any of these brands catching your interest, what do you do? You Google. So if you can pass the moment when you need visibility to when Google can just offer you whatever you want and we are at that moment because they catch our interest and then keep offering you so many different things that you really want, offering the sponsors a much more targeted way without the visibility emotions and sport can bring. We are in a whole different new world and we need to adjust, adapt, anticipate and innovate, taking uh, inspiration from your last slide. And my last remark is that our audience in sports is growing old. All researches show that. People are much more into esports and sports betting than in any other thing. Fantasy sports and sports betting nowadays in the US is the trend. Just to give you a number, the World Cup in Russia, online sports betting reached out to 136 billion euros. 136 billion euros. Just the final match got more than 7 billion euros in online sports betting. Just to put this number into perspective, if you add up all FIFA's revenues from TV rights, sponsorships, ticketing, licensing, and whatever else they can get money from, FIFA got less than 6 billion euros with the World Cup in Russia. So we are talking about a new business that takes the content we generate as their main or their only source, making more money, much more money online than we are making in all deals we have. So looking towards the future, talking about globalization of sponsorship can only be comprehended if we see this phenomenon moving on in society and how people engage with sports nowadays and in the future. So with those remarks, I'd like to open the floor to the audience because I have a sign here. Remind your audience to be part of the conversation. So please, you have the floor. Any question? Oh, you had the first one, the gentleman at the front row.
Hello, for example. Um, uh, I'm Akanda from the Football Business Academy. Uh, I have a question for Mr. David. And uh, thank you for everyone for your talk. Uh, my question is, uh, so basically in China, for example, NBA is doing a great job. Um, and I mean, those amazing athletes like Stephen Curry, LeBron James, now uh, Clay Thompson came to China this summer. What are your, uh, in, for soccer, what are your, who, who, who's your audience um, apart from Cristiano Ronaldo? Who's the main um, athletes that you guys are, you know, uh, trying to attract to the Chinese community? And what is the effect of Japan playing, you know, like what role is, is Japan playing in the competition between China and Japan? On the final point, Japan really plays a very minimal part. It's a entirely different market. China might as well be Mars. Uh, the rest of the world is Earth. Uh, it has absolutely no impact on, on what's going in the Chinese market. I mean, the difference between basketball and football in terms of participation, basketball is way ahead of the game. It is, you can play at every school, university, there's courts, you can play for free. In terms of just access to the game, it's way easier. The NBA have had 200 people in China for, I don't know, 20 years or so. The NBA Finals were being broadcast in the 80s on CCTV. So they were way ahead of the game in terms of uh, penetration, broadcasting, and then fan development. So it's playing serious game of catch up. The culture of football is, is really where you have to focus because it's, it's almost non-existent. It's, if you're growing up in Brazil or even in the UK, I'm playing football with my dad, I'm playing football with friends, you go to the park, like that's how you get into football. Then you start watching it on TV, then you have a favorite team and then a favorite athlete, and you follow those guys for the rest of your life. There aren't parks in China that you can just wander out, over to and kick around with your friends. Like, grass is a scenic area in China, you can't run on it. So it's a more of a middle class sport, like you have to pay to book a pitch, is oversubscribed, there's, I mean, until really four years ago, there was not a commitment to invest into infrastructure, invest into new pitches and new areas to, to play the sport. So it's, it's a totally different ball game. Or ball game. But um, I think in terms of who they follow, like it's more of a mass market sort of celebrity and entertainment sport. So the players that have a personality, uh, of course, the Cristianos and the Messi because they're the one percent or the 0.1 percent of the best players in the world. But outside of that, it's the guys that create cool content, have a personality, are a little controversial, come out to China, make an impact, and also the legends like players like Kaká, Ronaldinho still do incredibly well commercially in China. It doesn't matter they're not playing anymore. Kobe Bryant's still easily the most successful basketball player for current commercial deals. He hasn't played for two, three years, so. It's, it's a long way behind. The culture of football needs to develop before the rest of the game does. Like, it's being forced and it's developing incredibly fast with the investment from government. But that's not going to lead to a national team that plays in the World Cup unless the culture changes. Uh, most parents in China grew up 70s, 80s. They didn't play football, so there's no way that they can teach their kids to play football. So it has to be done by the state, school system, government. And this is where clubs can have an impact, but at the moment, Clubs invest most of their time uh, building soccer schools in regions around China, which is great for a PR headline, but that really just teaches 50 kids. It's 1.4 billion people in China. 50 kids is not even making a dent. So unless you're able to scale a football development program to a whole region or a, a whole city or even a, just a small schooling system, it's not really having an impact. So biggest question that really, uh, whether it's a brand or whether it's a, a, a club going into China, has got to ask themselves is how are they helping the development of football in China, rather than just going in doing a deal taking from the country. If they solve that question, you have a phenomenal business model for the next uh, three to five years. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jean Fugero with uh, CIS. Tiago. We can't hear him. Yeah, a little, little louder. Hear. Just shout. Hello? Yep. Yeah. Oh, sorry. So, a uh, question to Tiago. 
you talked about anticipating, and I'm interested in hearing a bit more. So if we anticipate what the sponsors think, or perhaps um, in this case, Gatorade only, how do you see this transition that um, Pedro mentioned go into digital? The, the communication with the audience is changing the relevance of not only the, the sports, uh, the, the players, but also other sort of uh, influencers, perhaps surpassing uh, the importance of, of clubs or other rights holders. How do you see the sort of the evolution of uh, sponsorship going that way? If in the end, what will be actually the importance of, of, of the club to pay uh, big amounts of money to, to clubs? against going to sort of influencers that sometimes reach uh, much more. Is the way technology is developing and, and the digital and the communications a threat or opportunity for you know, the current rights holders? If you could develop a, a bit more in terms of w what you see for sponsorship in, in the near future. Well, I, I think there, there's, uh, there's an a, a important consideration around uh, this shift from, from TV to uh, streaming and the amount of content that we can see around a club, right? I think the, the, the documentary uh, that uh, Amazon ran with Manchester City, that, that's kind of a new paradigm in terms of what kind of access can we, can we have to a club. Uh, you know, in our conversations with, with the clubs, we are interested to know how much is the club willing to manage their, their overall relationship with their fans. Is this something that, you know, it's gonna be in total secrecy. Luckily, there's no coaches around here to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to, to hear what I'm gonna say, but, are we going to keep the routine of super secrecy? Nobody's allowed training. This is something internally. And what we sell is a 90-minute exposure on Sunday versus every um, moment there's an audience and uh, every moment there's a possible interaction, you know, uh, understanding that the ultimate uh, goal of a club is to win games on Sunday. But who's going to manage that? And that, that will impact who we're going to discuss is what, what are the mediums. If a club believes, a club, uh, uh, you know, our main deals are done with clubs uh, for a very particular reason for us, because we're an authentic brand that changes uh, athletic performance. And currently, the, 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 all the players are subject to what the club determines in terms of uh, fueling, which is our, uh, our product does, right? Hydration and energy and all that, that's determined by the club. Uh, so we, we naturally, we have to work through clubs. So it's, it's imperative our business, right? And our consumers want to know what those players have, uh, what they drink, what they take, uh, what protein or shake or whatever, and so they want to replicate that behavior. So for us, it's a mandate to be in the locker room working with uh, the uh, sports scientists of the club to make sure that our integration to that club is authentic and the players are really taking Gatorade during their, uh, their routine so they can maxim maximize their performance on Sunday. So this is our concern. So our concern is with that club, Who's managing that relationship? Are they going to manage? Are, gonna, are they going to keep third party in it to uh, a broadcast on Sunday? Or are they going to own their own shows or channel, channels? And uh, we, you know, we work with clubs that are very uh, well developed in that regard, right? So the uh, Barcelona's Instagram, for example, they always have uh, Instagram stories uh, prior to a game. It's key for us. It's almost more important to be in that Instagram stories than in the game itself. Because the game itself, they, they never stop. They barely stop. And when they stop, you know, it's a, a two-second thing where a coach can give them a hand and a Gatorade on the sideline so they can keep hydrated during the halftime. The real secret of our performance, and that depends by brand, right? Other brands could say something different. But for us, the real magic happens in the locker room. So just to give you a, a quick example around Barcelona is maybe the Instagram stories for us because that goes into the locker room of what happens before the game. Currently, no coach has allowed that uh, Instagram stories to go on with players on it. It's still an empty uh, uh, locker room. But imagine if we could see what happens prior to the game and the way they prepare, in our case, fueling with uh, 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 sports uh, uh, fuel products like uh, you know, a, a hydrator to prepare for the game. That's more important for us in our conversation with the consumer. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Pedro, Sinto, David, and Tiago. It has been my favorite presentation so far. And I have a question for Sinto. Um, <laughs> um, my question for you is about fan engagement. Uh, as you work in Barcelona, I wanted to ask you uh, top three strategies to keep the fan engagement, especially when, for example, with Madrid, uh, as you said, uh, Cristiano was key for the, for the team. 
uh, not only because in the game, but also for fans. And after he went to Juventus, um, ticket selling went down. So how to maintain, how, what will be your top three keys to maintain fan engagement in soccer? But before, before he responds, can you repeat it? It's your, your, your best presentation. I want to put in my Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, this has been my favorite presentation so far. I want to thank uh, Cinto, David, Thiago, and especially Pedro for being a great moderator. <laughs> Uh, this is interesting, it's, and it's, uh, this is not easy. Uh, for sure, the best strategy is to, to win leagues, and to win champions, and to win everything. If you win, you have more fans, and that's it. Okay? But my best recommendation, and, and this is not from FCB perspective, is that you need to generate a true content and, and a real content, you know? As Tiago said, we, we always work with um, Instagram, Instagram and, and with Facebook, with everything. And we want to, to see content, but, but you know, the best video from Messi was a video with, with his son, you know? Uh, singing, uh, I don't know the, the song, uh, maybe Esteban knows, uh, like uh, Sol Suret or something like that, like a, a children's song, you know? And that was the, the best post from Messi ever, you know? So we need to, to sit and to explore how we can connect with the fan and how we can generate a real content and not a Photoshop content and you know, a real, real content and, uh, and normal. We are normal, the, the football players are normal guys with a normal life. And we, we need to, to explain that type of, of content. The last question. Hi, my name is uh, Fred Vint uh, with applause. Uh, question is for Tiago. Uh, what is your preferred method of connecting with uh, your, your customers and do you have an in-venue strategy, or what would your thoughts be on in-venue type of uh, engagement? Oh, before, before he jumps into that, the best way is selling the product. <laughs> that's the best way to connect to your client. That, that's what we ultimately have to do, right, <laughs> in our jobs. Uh, and one of the things that I really like about working at PepsiCo, which owns uh, the Gatorade brand, is how business-driven we are. Right? So we have no space to, yeah, we're doing this, this is something great, but what about the business, right? It's ultimately our job to, to, to move a product. We have strong uh, uh, competitors. Um, I, think, I think who tells that is, is not our decision, right? We can influence, but the decision is really in the hands of our, uh, our consumers, Ridded, literally right now on the hands with the cell phone, right? That's the current format. And it, uh, it, it's interesting uh, that, that, you, that, that you ask because it seems very, uh, for us, seems obvious, right? Uh, you know, you need to, teach the, uh, to reach the consumer. Whatever he, is he doing? You have multiple options, multiple options. You know, uh, uh, the still broadcast uh, for the games are, are great, so you can use that. Social media, Instagram, not every player commercializes their Instagram, right? Uh, talking about ourselves is not that fun, so you have to find ways of, of doing that. But it's still interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll steal a little bit of your China example. How inside uh, you know business environments sometimes you get into this discussion. You know what? Let's play safe. Let's do TV, right? And and, and you have the data to say, well, maybe Instagram Stories for Barcelona is more here. Here's the data. But these discussions are still going on, and I think what uh, what allows that is that uh, you know still a lot of organizations are are based on what the CEO believes or you know the imperatives. And if, if you guys allow me to be a bit disruptive here in this conversation, I think sports has been uh, uh, pampered by great broadcast deals that have, allowed, have enabled them to grow exponentially the sport. So who am I to say they're wrong? But I think it, it's been a bit uh, pampered or a bit, uh, uh, a bit protected by huge broadcast deals that allow you to not think about your question, right? How are our fans engaged? You know, uh, I, I have uh, uh, young kids, they don't know what the meaning of TV is. 
right? What do you mean you had to, when you're our age, I tried to explain them that, you know, to watch an episode of uh, something that I, I'd like, I had to be in front of the TV, one set, at a certain part of our house, at one part of the day or week, to watch what I liked. And, and it's inconceivable from them that this, this can have happened. Couldn't you do this, just this, and things appear? It's easier for me to watch my favorite shows from my childhood today than it was when I was a child, right? Because uh, you go to YouTube and everything's available. So I, I think sport in general, I think that, uh, yeah, the idea of Sunday, 4 o'clock, well, we still need a one set, uh, it, it still has to be a one time in one location because we're still physical activity. But the way to engage that, right? I, I think the, right now, uh, you know, La Liga is present, one of the sponsors, and, you know, they are, uh, 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 I, I think they are faced with an interesting challenge here in the U.S. market with the be in sports uh, situation, right? Uh, but I think in, in tough times, it makes you creative. So I think uh, a lot of people are going to be faced with your question in the future, and I'll go back to my presentation. <laughs> I think it would be better for sports industry or clubs or rights holder or leagues to anticipate and innovate rather than the competitor taking over and suddenly people, you know, having no more broadcast rights and, and what happened to their business. So I, 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 I sorry, I, I explored a bit on, on your question, but I think it's, 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 a, it's an immense question. Uh, and uh, the ones that anticipate, we try to do that, but in a, but in a corporation, it's not always easy to move fast, right? Uh, but to me, this is the biggest question there is. How do you keep the conversation to your consumer as the consumer uh, ways of engaging and communicating is changing? Incredibly, incredibly fast. It's well, interesting because my, my daughter swipes the television like an iPad, you know? It, 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 is, is she right or is she wrong? Uh, right? Isn't it stupid it's that it's you right. cannot swipe your future. TV if you can't yeah, yeah. swipe your iPad? Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Our time on the stage is up. But the beauty of SoccerX is that we are now attending all other panels to learn a little bit more from the other speakers. And we are available to take your questions if you just approach us along the day and yeah, yeah, during course. the fair. So thank you very much. And thank, thank you, you very much for coming.